Right, we're in Deuteronomy 18, and I want you to notice verse number 15. It says, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. These are the words of Moses. He's telling the nation of Israel, Hey, there is a prophet that the Lord will rise like unto me. And I started, I started this new series last week. We had a look at Joseph as a type of Christ. We're now going to be looking at someone else like Christ. And it says, Moses saying these words, like unto me. And of course, I'll prove this in a moment to you, but of course Moses here is speaking of Jesus Christ. And if we continue, it says in verse number 16, According to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more that I die not. And the Lord said unto me, they have well spoken that which have they spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren. So again, this is being said by the Lord, like unto thee, like unto you, Moses. This prophet's going to be like you, Moses, and will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Now, isn't that the, isn't that, isn't that the truth of Jesus Christ? That he spoke all the words that the Father commanded him? You know, Christ came and, and taught perfectly. Yes, Christ was a prophet. He is the prophet that has been prophesied here in Deuteronomy 18. I want you to notice verse number 19. It's quite important. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. So as this prophet comes, this prophet to come, uh, preaches the words of God. You know, if people would not receive the words, God says that he will require it of them. He's going to hold them accountable for not receiving the words of this prophet to come. Now, I want you to keep your finger there in Deuteronomy 18. Actually, the truth is, you don't need to, actually. You can turn away from there. Come with me to John chapter 1. We've been going through the book of John. We've been going chapter by chapter through the book of John. And I just want you to notice that as we've been going through the book of John, I, I did touch upon it a few times. You know, the Jews at this time, they were waiting for this prophet to come. Okay, the prophet that God told of, of Moses, there's going to be a prophet like unto you, Moses. And yet, you know, you see here in, turn, turn with me to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse number 19. John chapter 1 has, you know, the story of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is doing a great work for God. He's doing baptisms. And, you know, the, the, the Pharisees and the, and the uh, Jews, they come up to him. They ask him, hey, who are you? Like, by what authority are you do, c conducting this ministry? And it says there in verse number 19, John chapter 1, verse number 19, and this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. So John the Baptist makes it very clear, look, I'm not the Christ. I'm not the one to come there. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Then they asked him these words, Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. And I'll show you in a moment the prophet they're referring to here, again, back to the, the, the prophecy that Moses gave, that God gave to Moses, that a prophet be raised like unto Moses. John the Baptist makes it very clear, no, I'm not that prophet. They're asking, are you that prophet? John the Baptist says, no, I'm not. Okay. Come with me to chapter 6 now. John chapter 6, verse number 14. John chapter 6 and verse number 14. John chapter 6, verse number 14, the Bible says, Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said... This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. So some people have seen the great miracles, the great works of Jesus Christ. And they're amongst themselves saying, well, this has to be that great prophet. This has to be the one that's been pro prophesied to come. That great prophet, again, coming back from uh, for what we read there in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Come with me to the next chapter, John chapter 7. John chapter 7, verse number 40. John chapter 7, verse number 40. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying... They're hearing the words of Christ said, of a truth, this is the prophet. Do you see how the Jews at this time, they're, they're expecting at some point this prophet to come. You know, at, at first they think, could it be John the Baptist? But John the Baptist makes it very clear, no, it's not, not me. And they're starting to realize, man, it's Jesus. Jesus is that prophet that's been prophesied to come. And then verse 41 says, others said, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? And so, what they're saying, they're both correct. Christ is both that prophet, and he, of course, is the Christ. Now, come with me to Acts chapter 3. Come with me to Acts chapter 3. This is all just an introduction, just to show you that Christ is that prophet, 
like unto Moses, if you want to put it that way. Acts chapter 3, please. Acts chapter 3. I'll give you a moment to turn there. Acts chapter 3 and verse number 20. Acts chapter 3 and verse number 20. The Bible says, And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Oh, I love that, by the way. Uh, you've, you've got the, uh, the, the, um, the apostles here speaking that Christ has been before preached unto you. This is something that is found in the Old Testament Scriptures because the New Testament Scriptures are not yet written at this point. That's something, this has been told f- from, from the past. This is something that you guys should have known a long time ago, according to the Scriptures. Verse number 21. Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God have spoken, look at this, which God have spoken by the mouth of all His holy prophets since the world began. You know, all of God's prophets, all of them, spoke of Christ. They all did. Did Moses speak of Christ? Well, let's keep going there, verse number 22. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Like, like Moses, okay? Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. So you can see here the apostles, they're confirming that this prophet that's been prophesied back in uh, Deuteronomy, this prophet like unto Moses is Jesus Christ. You know, all the prophets gave witness of Christ. They all spoke of Christ. Even Moses did when he spoke of this prophet to come. Now notice verse number 23. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Now, we actually get the definition of what God meant in Deuteronomy 18, verse number 19. I'll read that verse again. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. I will hold him accountable. In what way are people going to be held accountable? Well, it gets defined for us there in Acts chapter 3, verse number 19. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yes, you know, if you reject Jesus Christ, if you reject His words, if you reject His salvation, you reject Him, you will be destroyed. You know, you, you'll be cast away from the people, you'll be thrown into the, into the hellfire, you'll be destroyed. You know, and, and you see just how serious it is to reject this prophet to come. And so, just like we looked at last week, we saw Joseph as a type of Christ. The, the title for the sermon this evening is Moses, a type of Christ. Moses a type of Christ, because Christ would be like him, okay? And, you know, again, uh, just, I, I don't think I explained this very clearly last week. Uh, the word type is just a, a theological word for all these ideas of, of something that is, where Christ is like something in the Old Testament Scriptures, or a shadow or an illustration of things to come would be pointing us to Christ. And in the, the- theological realm, they would say that, uh, you know, objects of the Old Testament, objects or practices or people, they're the type of Christ, and Christ is the antitype, okay? The antitype is, is, the, is the, 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 the product of what that type represented. And so Moses is also a type. You know, in the life of Moses, we'll also see pictures of Christ in, in his life. And if you can, uh, come with me to uh, Matthew chapter 2, please. Come with me to Matthew chapter 2. Moses is a type of Christ. Now, you know, just like Joseph, I- I'm not going to have enough time in one sermon to sh- just show you all the parallels. Okay, I'm, I'm really just scratching the surface in these sermons. I've only got an hour. When it comes to Moses, I had too many, I had too many parallels to, to teach on today. I just pulled out certain ones and look, in your own time, study the life of Moses, study the life of Joseph, and see if you can find any other parallels with Jesus Christ. There's just too many to go through in one sermon. Okay? But when we think of Moses, think about his birth. Moses, of course, was born in, in uh, Egypt. Sorry, just another parallel just came to me. Right. You've got the people of God under a foreign government, under a foreign power, under the power of the Egyptians when Moses was born. Of course, when Christ was born, he also was born under a foreign power, wasn't he? The Roman Empire. You know, anyway, that's not one of my, on my list, but there's an extra one that you can add. Okay? But when, of course, when Moses was born, we have the famous story when uh, Pharaoh wanted all the Hebrew men, men children, to be, to be, to be uh, put to death as soon as they were born. And we know that Moses' mother protected him. You know, she kept him for a while. And then when she couldn't hold, you know, keep him a secret any longer, she put him into that little basket, into the river. And, uh, 
Of course, that's because that there was a desire to, to kill these children. And it's, did I get you to turn to Matthew 2? You can say Matthew 2. I'll read to you from Exodus chapter 1, verse number 22. It says, And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. And so from Moses' infancy, they sought to kill him. Not just himself, but all the children that was, you know, in his age, you know, around his age. And of course, we have the story of Jesus in Matthew chapter 2, verse number 13. Matthew chapter 2, verse number 13, it says, And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. And so the first thing, that, or the second thing now, <laughs> uh, point that I have for you uh, tonight, brethren, is both had attempts to be killed in their infancy. Both Jesus and Moses had attempts to, be, uh, to kill them in their infancy. And again, I, I just want to, uh, the only reason I'm showing you this, brethren, is just so you can appreciate that Christ is everywhere in the Scriptures. Every, even when you least expect Him to be. You know, you'll find parallels of the life of Christ, you know, in the characters, in the object lessons, in the examples, uh, in, the, in the practices that they did in the Old Testament. You will find Christ, and I really want you to be excited when you open the Old Testament, and it might feel a little bit dry. It might feel like, you know, these are passages that I just prefer not to read. You know, I, I was uh, cleaning a customer's house just this week, and he said to me, because he knows I'm a pastor, he says, um, no, I just much rather read the New Testament. I don't like the Old Testament. And I said to him, well, if you come to my church, you're going to hear it all. <laughs> you know, Old Testament, New Testament, you know, because the Old Testament taught us of Christ. Every prophet, you know, every book of the Bible points us to Christ in some way. And it's exciting when you see Christ in its pages. But both had attempts to be killed in their infancy. You're there in Matthew chapter 2, and let's continue there, verse number 15. And was there, that was in Egypt. Isn't that interesting that they're both in Egypt, though? You know, Moses was born there, and Jesus eventually, they had to flee into Egypt. Verse number 15. And there was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Do you notice that there, there had to be a prophecy to be fulfilled? That out of Egypt, Christ will be called out of, out of Egypt. I mean, he was born in Bethlehem. But he had to go into Egypt for this prophecy, to, prophecy to, to be fulfilled. The next point that I have for you, of course, is that both Moses and Jesus were caught out of Egypt. Right? Moses was born there. He eventually found himself out of Egypt. Come with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Come with me to Hebrews 11. Of course, very famous chapter, the great men of faith. And we have Moses listed in that great chapter. Let's come, come with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 27. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 27. Hebrews eleven twenty seven, 27, speaking of Moses, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. So why did he flee Egypt? For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. The reason Moses left Egypt is because he had his eyes on the Lord God. He says, this is not the place that I ought to be. I need to remove myself out of this land. See, they were both caught out of Egypt. They both left Egypt. Okay, Isn't that amazing? You know, that Christ had to go into Egypt to flee from Herod, to fulfill. And you can see again the, the parallels or the types, you know, being fulfilled, completely fulfilled in Christ. Now that passage that you read in Matthew 2.15, uh, you know, that said, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord, by the prophet saying, out of Egypt shall, sorry, out of Egypt have I called my son. Do you guys know where that passage comes from? It's actually found in the book of Hosea. Okay, now I'll quickly read to you from Hosea 11. You don't need to turn there. Hosea 11 verse 1. If you want the reference, you can look at it in your own time. Hosea chapter 11 verse 1. I find this one really fascinating actually, this passage here. Hosea chapter 11 verse 1. Now when you're reading the book of Hosea, it's clearly talking about the northern kingdom of Israel. Okay, and then Hosea is preaching about how, you know, God took Israel out of the land of Egypt. And it says in Hosea 11 verse 1, when Israel was a child... Then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. The Old Testament is speaking about Israel as a nation. Again, being led by Moses. 
And, I, 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 you know, I don't want to get too far from that. You know, it's kind of out of scope of my sermon, but, you know, the point of my sermon is that Moses is a type, but we learn here, when Israel left Egypt, after God put the ten plagues on Egypt and they left, that that's a picture, that's another type, that Israel was a type of Christ. And that's where the reference comes from. Like when you read the Old Testament, you think it's talking about the Old, Test- Old Testament nation of Israel. And yes, that's, the, that's the, uh, the surface level application, but it's there as a type that Christ would be called out of Egypt. Let me read it to you again, Hosea 11 verse 1. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Again, just showing the connective tissue between the Old Testament and the New Testament. How can you love the New Testament and not love the Old Testament? I don't understand. Because the New Testament is built on the Old Testament. The New Testament shines light on the teachings of the Old Testament that always pointed us to Christ to begin with. The same customer said, the reason I love the New Testament is because of Jesus. Yeah, but Jesus is everywhere in the Old Testament. <laughs> you're, you're, you're missing the point. You're missing the point of the Bible. Another reason I like Hosea 11 verse 1 it says, I called my son out of Egypt. You know, you, every time you see Israel in the Bible, the Old Testament nation of Israel, it's always in the masculine form. My son in this, all right? And of course, Israel, who was Israel? He was a man, wasn't he? He was Jacob, right? Jacob had his name changed to Israel, which means a prince. He had power over God and power over, uh, over man. The reason I'm saying that to you is because everywhere you go in the Bible, you'll, you'll find Israel again and again being referenced in the masculine because it's a masculine name. It's a type of Christ. But you know what's strange? People will turn to Revelation chapter 12 and say that that woman, clothed in the sun and the moon at her feet, that's Israel, the woman. Huh? <laughs> I mean, like, you read the Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Israel is always masculine, but we get to Revelation chapter 12 and now it's a girl. And, you, have, you know, and like, these are, dispens- these are strange dispensational teachings. Like, to me, it's like, what? Haven't you read the Bible? You know, I, I, it's, it's just, it's so clear that it's a masculine name, that it, it's, it's Jacob, Israel is Jacob, right? And here, God refers to him as his son. And the reason I say that is because, you know, there's this funny teaching out there, I don't know if you've heard it as well, they'll say that uh, the church is the bride of Christ, they'll say, which is kind of a half-truth. But then they'll say, but Israel was a bride of the father. Really? The father wanted to marry a man? Like, I'm just telling you things because I hear these strange doctrines, strange things. And unfortunately, God's people at church, they just swallow up these lies. And it doesn't make any sense. They'll say, well, Israel's a woman. Revelation 12. Okay, but everywhere in the Bible, and I, look, I'm going off topic, aren't I? That was <laughs> anyway, like that was, you know, oh, the Bible, it's it's you know, it's a type of Christ Israel was, and in fact, God's people in the New Testament are part, you know, are fellow citizens with the saints. You know, it's not a physical Israel; it's a it's a spiritual Israel that our eyes are upon, that we're part of. I always just find the, te- the teachings that I hear behind the pulpit sometimes. They just blow me away. Like, just how ridiculous are these things? It's strange. It's super strange. Uh, look, I'm going off topic now, but let's just do one more thing. Come back with me to Deuteronomy chapter 18, please. It's not even my notes. Deuteronomy chapter 18, please. Come back. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Because I want you guys to be, like, I don't even want you to take everything that I teach. You know, I want you to, like, this, find out for yourself. Look in the Bible yourself. Figure it out for yourself. You know, you have the Holy Ghost in you. The Father loves you. He wants you to read His Word and learn, you know, the great truths of the Bible. And in Deuteronomy chapter 18, let's just drop down to the last verses. Verse number, verse number 20. So, we just finished talking about Christ. And look, I, I have gone off topic, I'm sorry. But anyway, verse number 20. But the prophet, which shall presume to speak a word in my name. You know, preachers can presume truths. Okay, meaning that they don't really know it's true, but prophets, preachers will actually preach lies, presuming that it's true. Okay, it's not that they've confirmed that it's true, it's not that they've gone to God's word to check it that it's true, they just speak it, you know. And it says, Look, if a brother shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, 
even that prophet shall die. Look how serious preaching God's word is to God. Like, Reverend, I want you to understand I'm a very careful preacher. Not because I lack confidence. Okay, what I know in the Bible, what is black and white in the Bible, I'll preach that with confidence. But things that are not black and white, things that are not are plainly stated, I'm not going to preach that with confidence. I'm not going to just presume that it's true. Because look, if I was a preacher in the Old Testament, and I'm preaching lies, and I'm saying, thus saith the Lord, and the Lord did not say, God would want that preacher killed. Look how serious it is to preach the, the Bible to God's people. And I, it just, it, it confuses me how people can take be, preaching God's word so lightly. Just making up stories. The father was married to Israel. No, because marriage is between a man and a woman. That's the, Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 explains to us what marriage is. People start saying all kinds of ridiculous things or half-truths. Things they presume to be in the Bible. You know, I once asked my pastor, Pastor, can you show me anywhere in the Bible that it says that the rapture is going to take place before the tribulation? And I was being kind, and, and you know what he said to me? No, nowhere in the Bible does it say the rapture is before the tribulation, but it's implied. It's the presumption. You should just know that by reading the Bible, even though it doesn't state it anywhere. Thus saith the Lord, preaches behind the pulpit, that Christ is coming before the tribulation. Where does the Bible say that? You're just presuming that to be true. So you've got to be, see how careful you've got to be when you preach? Like, it's worthy of death, brethren. Do you understand why I have a fear of God when I get behind this pulpit? Do you understand why I don't just repeat things that any other preacher says unless I check it for myself and I have the confidence to know that's what it says? I don't have the confidence to preach something just because another preacher has the confidence to preach that. I have to see it in God's Word. Let's keep going there. It continues there in verse number... Uh, sorry, verse, uh, chapter 18, verse number 20, uh, 22. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuous, presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. You know, th there are preachers, man... If these charismatic and Pentecostal preachers lived in the time of the Old Covenant, there would be no Pentecostals and charismatic preachers. They'd all be put to death. Anyway, setting that aside, I just want you to understand, I take preaching God's Word so seriously, it gives me fear. Like, I, I'd rather, Lord, can you just, someone else do it? Because I don't want to make a mistake. You know, and if I make a mistake, you know, and I, I just got to own up to a brethren, I, I made a mistake, I'm sorry. <laughs> But I want you to notice that, like, don't be afraid. So you got to realize, you got you got to figure out: did the prophet preach correctly or not? Don't just take what the prophet says. Okay, you, you got to find out for yourself. Does it line up with God's word? Is it true? Okay, I mean, there are a lot of doctrines that, for me, in my brain, are half baked. It could be true. Don't know. Possibly. But then, because I don't have that confidence, because I don't know it black and white, I'm not going to preach it behind the pulpit. I don't want to be one of these preachers in the Old Testament where I'm being put to death. <laughs> Because I just preach something, because it's just presumed, it's just, you ought to know that. Just, you know, without, you, without having some scriptures telling us that's the truth. I've gone off topic. I've gone off topic. All right, let's get back to it. Come with me to, uh, back to Hebrews 11, please. Hebrews 11, Hebrews 11, and verse number 24. Hebrews 11, verse number 24. I, I just want to, like, you know... I just want to uphold the importance of preaching the Bible. You know, and, and men that preach here in my absence, I appreciate you guys, but I, I want you to have a fear of God. Make sure that you, you just preach what is true, what you know 100%. You know, if, if you haven't got the confidence, just, just leave it alone. Just, just cover the things that you know to be 100% true. You know, preach those things. Hebrews eleven twenty four, please. Hebrews eleven twenty four. Hebrews eleven twenty four. By faith Moses... When he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. 
Next point that I have for you, brethren, is that both, both refused the pleasures of an earthly kingdom. Both refused the pleasures of an earthly kingdom. Moses was privileged to, you know, be taken into Egypt and given the best of everything. Pharaoh's daughter, Pharaoh's grandson, as it were. He'd have the best education. He'd have, you know, all the finances he needs. He'd have a reputation. All would look up to him. He says, no, I'd rather suffer like Christ. Isn't that what it says? I'd rather suffer like Christ. Did Moses know Christ? Of course he did. <laughs> Again, don't people say that the Old Testament saints knew nothing of Christ? Well, Moses clearly knew about the sufferings of Christ and says, I want to be partaker of that. And when did Christ refuse an earthly kingdom? Well, I'll just quickly read to you, you guys know this passage, when Jesus Christ is being tempted in the wilderness by Satan. It says in Matthew chapter 4, verse 8, and again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, all these things will I give thee if that will fall down and worship me. Then, Jesus, uh, then saith Jesus unto him, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. See, Satan was willing to give Jesus Christ all the kingdoms, all the glory, okay, of the earth. And Christ says, no, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. So, you know, the eyes of Jesus was on the Lord God, the eyes of Moses was on Jesus, the sufferings of Christ. They both refused an earthly kingdom. No, we don't want that, you know. And uh, I, I, love, I love that. And, I, you know, again, I, I just see the eyes of Christ and the eyes of Moses not on this world. And, brethren, our eyes ought to not be on this world either. You know, uh, again, it's easy to look at others achieving and their possessions and their wealth and, and think, you know, you may want that. But, brethren, honestly, you've got to set that aside. You know, serve the Lord God, right? Put Him first, you know. Uh, uh, his kingdom and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. You know, set your eyes on, on the Lord God. Set your eyes on the sufferings of Christ. And, uh, you know, I, I love this example that we see. You say, well, hold on. Isn't Jesus Christ coming back one day to rule over the entire earth? Isn't he going to have an earthly kingdom one day? Well, let me just quickly read to you from John 18, 36. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. He says, my kingdom's not from here. My kingdom's not from this world. Of course, the kingdom of Christ is the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of heaven. And when Christ rules this earth, it's not a bottom-up kingdom. It's not a kingdom that's been given to him by the world. No, it's a kingdom that's been given to him by the Father. And he brings that kingdom on this earth and takes over every single power and, and you know, principality that's on this earth. That kingdom is a heavenly kingdom. It's not an earthly kingdom. But both, both refuse the pleasures of earthly kingdoms. Come with me to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 7, please. Acts chapter 7 and verse number 23. Acts chapter 7, verse number 23. Acts chapter 7 and verse number 23, please. Now, of course, we know the famous story of Moses leading the Israelites out of Egypt. Did you know, before that took place, 40 years before that happened, he tried to do it once before that, and he failed. He tried to be the deliverer of, of uh, the Israelites, but he failed. Okay, he tried, tried it when he was 40 years old. Eventually, he was 80 years old when he took the Israelites out of Egypt. Okay? But it says here in Acts chapter 7, verse number 23, Acts chapter 7, verse number 23, and when he was full, 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. You guys know that story? He ended up killing. He went to the defense of a fellow Jew. He ended up killing the Egyptian man. Look at verse 25. This is important. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. But they understood not. So as Moses went to deliver or, or to protect that fellow Israelites, he thought they would understand that he, Moses, would be the deliverer of them out of Egypt. But they understood not. 
He fails in his first attempt, Moses does. And then verse number 26, And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove, and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren, why do ye wrong one to another? But he that, but he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? You see, both Moses and Jesus were rejected by their own. Both Jesus and Moses were rejected by their own. <laughs> Moses went, again, self you know, to defend an Israelite. In that process, an Egyptian dies. He thinks they'll surely realize I'm here to deliver them. That's God's going to use me to deliver them. But what do they, what do they say? What do the brethren say? Who's made you a ruler and judge over us? Like, rejecting him. And of course, this is why he ends up fleeing. He ends up fleeing and God calls him 40 years later to do the work. I mean, Moses knew his, what, what he had to achieve. But of course, God's timing is not always our timing, is it? <laughs> Moses had to wait another 40 years. You imagine having to wait till you're 80 to fulfill what God really wanted from you. <laughs> that's pretty crazy. You know, that's pretty... But anyway, you know, we see that the brethren rejected uh, Moses, at least the first time. And of course, in the Bible, in John chapter 1, verse 10, about Jesus, it says, He was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not. He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. Okay, the vast majority of the Jews at the time of Christ did not receive Him. You know, especially the, the leaders, especially those in power and authority, they rejected Christ. And of course, the, the rest of the people, they're just going to follow their leaders. They're going to, well, the leaders aren't believing on Him, and... Uh, you know, of course, many, many did not believe in Christ. Many did not receive him. And it was that prophet that was prophesied all the way back to, from Moses. You know, that God was telling him, you've got to listen to him. You know, this, this prophet's going to speak all my words. And if you don't listen to him, if you don't receive him, God's going to hold you accountable. And the same thing, you know, as we go out and we preach the gospel, you know, people have the opportunity to hear the great news of Jesus. And if they reject you, look, really they're rejecting Christ. You know, God's going to hold them accountable one day. That you came to the door, knocked on the door with love to show them the way of heaven and they, they're going to be held accountable, you know, for what they've done. Come back with me to Exodus chapter 34, please. Exodus 34. What else can we see between Moses and Jesus Christ? Remember, Moses as a type of Christ. What other parallels do we see? Well, in Exodus 34, Exodus 34 verse number 27, Exodus 34, Exodus 34 and verse number 27. It says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words, for after the tenor of these words have I made a covenant with thee and with Israel. And he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water, and he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. You guys know where I'm going with this one, surely. Okay, both fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Okay, isn't that amazing? Moses with the Father, Moses with God, you know, writing down these words, neither he didn't eat nor drink. And uh, this, is, this is amazing. This is amazing. I mean, I don't know, does anyone know how long you can go without drinking water? What's the, what's the natural body able to, does anyone know? It's, it's like two weeks, isn't it? Is it three, four, five days? Okay, yeah, not too long at all. How did Moses go 40 days without drinking water? Of course, he had the supernatural power of God upon him. Okay? And, you know, of course, Jesus Christ, as he went into that wilderness, we already saw the, where he was tempted by the devil to worship him and he would have the kingdoms of the earth. I'll just read to you from Matthew 4.1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. You know, I've heard of people fasting for that long. That's, that's full on. That, that's, that's, you know, of course, you'd have to drink water. <laughs> if, you, if you're going to make that decision fast, I'm going to try that 40 days and 40 nights, see how the power of God will come upon me during that time. Well, make sure you have some water. Okay, <laughs> Make sure you have some water on the side. All right, um, where else can I get to turn? Come with, me to, um, come with me to Luke chapter 9. Come with me to Luke chapter 9. Actually, no. Come with me to Numbers 13. Numbers 13, sorry. Go to Numbers 13. Numbers 13 and verse number 1. Now, when Moses obviously uh, led Israel out of Egypt, where were they headed? 
They were headed to the promised land, weren't they? All right? and, and before they, they, they went into the promised land, God instructed Moses to do what? To send some spies onto the land. All right? So in Numbers 13, verse 1, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All those men were heads of the children of Israel. So how many tribes were there at this time? Twelve tribes of Israel. And if Moses is going to send one of each tribe, how many men did he send? Twelve. Okay. Isn't that a parallel? Isn't that a type of Christ? You know, how many men did Jesus Christ appoint as his apostles? Twelve. Yeah. You stay there in Numbers 13. Let me read to you from Luke 9. Luke 9 verse 1. Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Now, I understand that Moses did not send his 12 spies to preach the gospel. Like, I understand that. I'm not trying to make that the parallel. But the fact that they both send in 12 men is the parallel. Okay? But I want you to notice something else. You stay there in Numbers 13. There's more to it. So, of course, Jesus Christ is sending these apostles, these 12 apostles out to preach the gospel. It says in verse number three, And he said unto them, Take nothing for your journey, neither staves, nor scrip, neither bread, neither money, neither have two coats apiece. And whatsoever house ye enter into, there abide and thence depart. And whosoever will not receive you, when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Okay, so yes, They've got great, great abilities to cast out devils, to heal, but primarily they're going to preach the gospel. That's why the 12 were sent. All right. Come back with me to Numbers 13 and look at, drop down to verse number 17. So just between the verses, the verses that we read in verse number 17, we just have the different men, the different names that uh, Moses chose to be these spies. And then in verse number 17, it says, And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, Get you up this way southward and go into the mountain and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwell if they're in, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and what, the land, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds. So look, look at the cities, look at the towns, look, look at the places they live. Of course, that's what Jesus Christ told them to go but to every town. But then it says in verse number 20, And what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be good therein or not, and be ye of good courage, I want you to know the next words, and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. I want you to notice what Moses tells his, his spies. When you come back, bring of the fruits of the land. I want you guys to go and pick the fruits. I want you to bring back the fruit. And it's a time of the first ripe grapes. It's, it's a time of harvest for the grapes. And of course, you know, many times in the, in the Bible, we see the parallels of being fruitful, right? Uh, and and what, what's being fruitful? Winning souls, okay? And, you know, our goal is to bring, bring in the sheaves. Isn't that how the hymn goes? Bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. And, you know, we ought to be fruitful. We ought to, uh, you know, go out into this land of, of, the, of the Sunshine Coast and, and look at the places where, where people live and, and to go out and preach the gospel and ideally, you know, bring this fruit to church as well. You know, but, you know, preaching the gospel, winning souls, that's a very fruitful thing that you can do. And you can see the parallels with Jesus and Moses. They both sent 12, 12 to go out to look at the land. Now, not only that, if you're there in... Oh, no, you're not. You're not there. You're in Numbers. So come back with me to Numbers 11. Come with me to Numbers 11. I'll show you another interesting parallel with Moses and Jesus. Well, you're turning to Numbers 11. I'll read to you from Luke chapter 10. So I originally read to you from Luke 9, where Jesus sends his 12 apostles. Then when they get back, you know what Jesus does next? He appoints another 70. Another 70 apostles to go out there and continue preaching the gospel. And it says there in Luke 10 verse 1, After these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also, and sent them two and two before his face 
into every city and place, whither he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the labourers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth labourers into his harvest. So he sends out another 70, right? The first 12 laid the groundwork, he sent another 70 out there. Well, if, look at Numbers 11, verse number 24. It says, And Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord and gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and set them round about the tabernacle. What was the role of these 70 men? Verse number 25, And the Lord came down in a, in a cloud and spake unto him, and took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the 70 elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. You see, both Moses and Jesus ordained 70 men to preach. Both Jesus and Moses ordained 70 to preach. Isn't that interesting? You think it's just a coincidence these numbers are in the Bible like that? You really think that? I don't think so. <laughs> There are just too many parallels. Christ is everywhere in the Bible. Everywhere. Okay? Every, every story, pay attention. See if you can find Christ in those stories. Where can I get to turn? Come with me to um, Hebrews chapter 9, please. Come with me to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. And I'm on my last point now. Hebrews chapter 9, please. I'm on my last point. So let me just go through some of those things, uh, some of the, uh, the types or the parallels that we see with Christ. The first one that I had was both had attempts to be killed in their infancy. Both were called out of Egypt. Both refused the pleasures of earthly kingdoms. Both were rejected by their own. Both fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Both sent out 12 men. Both also ordained 70 to preach. And of course, probably the biggest parallel between Jesus Christ and Moses is that both ushered in covenants between God and man with the shedding of blood. Both ushered in covenants between God and man with the shedding of blood. Now, while you're turning there to Hebrews chapter 9, I'll quickly read to you from Mark chapter 14, verse 23. These are, uh, this is about, about Christ. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. This is my blood of the New Testament. Christ came and brought in a New Testament, and it would be by the shedding of his blood. Okay? That's why we have in the Bible the Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay? But you're there in Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 15. Hebrews 9, 15. And for this cause... Actually, this, this verse is so important. Can you please pay attention to this verse? Just this verse, okay? And for this cause, he is the mediator, speaking of Jesus, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, okay, by the means of his death, right? The death of Christ. I want you to notice the next phrase, the next phrase here. For the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament. I want you to pick that up. Why did Christ die? For the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament. So everyone that lived under the First Testament or the Old Covenant or the Old Testament, they're all different ways of saying the same thing, how were they saved? By the death of Christ. Isn't that what it says? That's what it says. Isn't it strange when preachers say to you they were saved by following the Old Testament laws, that was saved by offering the Old Testament sacrifices, that was saved by offering the lamb upon the altar. Reverend, they were not saved by such things. All of these things, all these good things of the Old Testament that they did, again, pointed to Christ, pointed to the, to the sufferings of Christ. Anyone that got saved in the Old Testament was saved by the death of Jesus Christ. The bringer in of the new covenant. The new covenant in his shed blood. I just want to show you, isn't that a black and white scripture right there? That you can just say, you know what? I've heard preachers say to me over and over again, people in the Old Testament were saved by their works. They were saved by keeping the Old Testament law. Nobody could keep the Old Testament law perfectly. 
But doesn't that show you just how slack preachers are? They preach presumptuously things, thus saith the Lord, when God never said such things. Again, under the Old Testament, they'd be put to death. Make sure the doctrines that you believe, you see black and white scriptures. Black and white. You can read it for yourself. You can show anybody, anyone that's honest will look at that passage and read it and go, yes, that's what it says. And that's my challenge to you, church. There's a lot of great preachers. I don't think I'm even one of them. There's a lot of great preachers online. And I encourage you, listen to great preachers online. Listen to them, please. Yes. Learn God's Word. But then go back to the Bible. Please, you have to do this. You know, even when you think, I I always go back to the Bible. No, you don't. Because I don't do it all the time. (laughs) I know what my failings are. I know what my failings have been over the years. I know I've been in church. I know I've sat there in the pew, listened to some preacher and just go, yep, that must be true, without checking for myself. I want my church to be better than what I was going to church. You know, I want my preachers behind this pulpit to be better. Even if you're not given a title, even if you're not a deacon, even if you're not a pastor, I want the preachers behind this pulpit to be the best preachers in Australia. Because we're careful. Because we have a fear of God. We only speak what is clearly laid out for us in God's Word. For the fear of being put to death by God. Church is so important to me, brethren, you know. And even though I have less time to prepare you know, sermons these days, it's, it's still very important to me. I'm not going to be sitting there for 10 minutes getting a sermon together for you. You know, I'm, I'm doing the best I can with the time that I've, that's been allocated to me to give you something, you know, that you can take away and absorb and appreciate. You know, you can see there's been due diligence, due study, and you can turn to the passages with me. You can read it for yourself and, you know, because I, I really, you know, we don't know what the future holds. Like, I don't know if you're always going to be my church members. You might find yourself in other places in Australia, under other churches, under different pastors, you know, even pastors that you think you can trust. And you've got to go and look for it yourself. I'm not saying I'm the only preacher that preaches great tr- truths. You know, in fact, I've, I've said many things that have been presumptions. Things that I've heard over the years that I've never gone back to God's Word to find out. And I hope I can be honest enough to say, you know what, I wasn't right about that. Or I wasn't sure about that. I shouldn't have said that behind the pulpit. But I want you to be careful because there's so many independent fundamental Baptists that will strangely teach the Old Testament saints were saved by sacrificing animals on the altar. No, Christ had to die even for those under the Old Testament, even for the transgressions of the Old Testament. That was the point of Christ dying. Don't forget, Christ is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. Or is it the world? How's it go again? World. world. Slain from the foundation of the world. Sorry. Let me read verse number 15 again. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Boy, isn't that wonderful? Christ has died for all. Okay, verse number 16. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator, of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Okay, so when Christ died is when the New Testament began, at the death of the testator, at the shedding of his blood. Now look at verse 18. So hold on, well Moses didn't die. Moses did not shed, you know, he did not uh, shed his blood uh, to bring in the Old Testament, did he? But then it says in verse 18, whereupon neither the First Testament was dedicated without blood. So it's saying here, the First Testament was dedicated with blood. There was death that enforced this First Testament, the Old Testament. And again, the shedding of the blood of the Old Testament is again a type, a picture of the shedding of blood of Jesus Christ. Verse number 19, For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats and with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people 
saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. I don't know if you knew that or not, but the Old Testament Israelites, when they accepted this covenant with God, that God, that, you know, um, God will be their God and they will be the people of God under the Old Testament, that these animals were sacrificed, the blood was taken, and if you were living in that time, you'd be sprinkled with the blood of these animals. How would you feel about that? <laughs> I probably wouldn't feel very good, but you're sprinkled with the blood of these, these animals. But again, a picture that we've been sprinkled, we've been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so what, there was a death, wasn't there? There was, a, there was death that took place, the death of calves and, and goats. And, you know, again, not that the blood of calves and goats could save anybody. That was the whole point Christ had to die. But isn't it interesting that people still believe in order to be saved that they have to do the works, they have to keep the Ten Commandments, they have to keep the, you know, the commandments of God in order to be saved. Well, you know what? Anyone trying to be saved by their good works, it's like they're trying to be saved by the sprinkling of the blood of animals without the sprinkling of the blood of Christ. That's really, like, they're going to go to heaven, they're going, well, yep, I, I did the best I can by your laws, God. No, the blood of animals will never save you. That's what the Old Testament... You try to get saved under the Old Testament, the Old Testament never provided salvation. The point of the Old Testament is that God would have a, a, a nation... Okay, a nation which would perform these, these, these practices, you know, uh, showing Christ, picturing Christ, that people would have their faith in Christ, that even if you transgressed under the old covenant, you would still be saved by the blood of Christ. Where God would have his people. There was nothing, nothing ever wrong with the old covenant. It was just never a covenant of salvation. Salvation was always by the blood of Christ, by the bringing in of the New Testament. It's always been that way. And so you can see why it's so important that we look at types. We see where Christ is found all over the Bible. And we can see where people are trying to follow the type today instead of accepting the antitype, which is Christ. People try to follow the Sabbath today, right? Uh, the Seventh-day Adventists believe in order to be saved, you've got to keep the Sabbath. They go as far as saying, if you worship God on Sunday, you're taking the mark of the beast. Seventh-day Adventists. Because they're so caught up on the type. They've forgotten the antitype. They've forgotten that Christ is the Sabbath. Christ is our rest. That we rest from works. And we just rest in the finished work of Christ. Again, the Sabbath is a type of Christ, isn't it? And that's what the Old Testament was all about. These practices, these, these uh, object lessons, these people... You know, for the Old Testament believers, before the death of Christ, that they would hear the preaching of Christ. They would be able to place their faith on the coming Messiah. They'd be able to place their faith on the coming prophet to come. And that God will wipe away all their sins, even the sins from the Old Covenant, even the sins before the Old Covenant was put into place. But brethren, that's the last one I had for you today, is that both are shedding covenants between God and man with the shedding of blood. And I guess my last question for you in relation is that, of that is, how do you want to be saved? I know you're all saved today. But if you could choose the blood of animals or the blood of Christ, you've got a choice. The blood of animals is the law. You want to be saved by works? Well, number one, you won't be able to keep the law. And number two, the blood of animals does not save anybody. They're just types. They're pictures. Learn the lessons that this was about Christ. The law was to show us that we're sinners. The law was to show us that we could not save ourselves. And the blood of the animals was to show us that one day we need the, the, the sprinkling of the blood of Christ put upon us, that we can only be saved by the shed blood of Christ. All right, brethren, the last point was both ushered in covenants between God and man with the shedding of blood. Okay, let's pray.